Good morning. Glad to have you here and glad you're still here. We had a pretty nice storm last night. And uh, well, I had a pretty nice storm. Mark, you're looking at me like I'm kind of crazy. <laughs> and, uh, and so glad you guys are here. Glad everything is well. We're excited to be back. I don't know about you, but I've missed church and uh, I've missed being back here. And so we're excited that we're here praying for everybody's safety and praying for those who uh, are with us on the live stream. And uh, like I said, we, we are all at different comfort levels, and I completely understand that. And so we're just praying for everybody moving forward. And so let's just go ahead and ask for the Lord to bless our time together, and then we'll go over a couple of announcements. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you. Thank you for today. Thank you, Lord, for your hand uh, protection not only on our church family and those of the friends of the church, but Lord, just protecting us here all throughout the area. And Lord, we just ask for your blessings and your grace upon this time gathered here together, Lord. Lord, I know for some folks, they uh, are here a little bit concerned. And Father, Lord, I just ask that you give them comfort that only you know how to give. Lord, I pray that the Holy Spirit be upon us now and encourage our hearts, maybe challenge us, maybe convict us, Father. And Lord, just give us a time that where we know that we've experienced a moment with you. And Lord, we just ask for your blessings upon this service this morning. In Jesus Christ's name I do pray. Amen. <clears throat> and so, as you may have mentioned, if you had not got the email, uh, we, I did send out an email a couple of days ago, so I just wanted to go over a couple of announcements that really pertain from that email moving forward. So tonight, the anniversary cookout has been postponed, obviously, for obvious reasons. Uh, we're still recuperating from some of the immediate concerns with the coronavirus here in our church. And so we're going to postpone that. Also, along with the anniversary cookout tonight, uh, the deacons and I decided it was probably best for uh, the Appreciation Sunday next Sunday to be postponed at a later date as well. And we're not canceling those as a permanent cancellation. Uh, we're just postponing those probably within the next few weeks or next month or so. Uh, as far as the Appreciation Sunday goes, that's going to be a little more tricky. So I'm just work with me. you. Just have patience with me as I worked with the preachers and uh, get them all back under one Sunday. So if that may, if that may be a little later. That's just how that will work. But the anniversary church out will be an easy fit. So we'll just rearrange that here in the next few weeks or early next month. And so you just be in prayer for that and pray for those that are away. I know some folks are still traveling and got some test messages over the last couple of days saying, hey, Pastor, I won't be here. And so you pray for those folks that are traveling as well. Also, we have our offering plate on the side entry table there. And if you have prayer requests, please, please, please uh, go ahead and put them in the offering plate. Those are received. And I've already put one in from a dear lady that notified me of a prayer request, and so we'll make sure that those get in the bulletin and emails and so forth, and we all need prayer, and that's what the church is here for, and so we want to pray for each other, and of course we want to pray for things specifically to your life and nature, and so if you have any prayer requests, please do put them in the offering plate along with your offerings as well. And I think that's really it for our announcements today, and so this will be again a little bit more of a, a shortened service that we're kind of used to. Moving forward next Sunday, we'll talk about a little bit more of the recovery um, in Sunday school and evening services and what those things look like here in the next Sunday or two. So you'll be receiving an email. I'll be talking to you guys about that here as well um, once we get in touch with the leadership team going forward. So just be in prayer for our, our leadership team as we, do, as we look forward to the next couple of weeks. And uh, you know we are wanting to get back to services as soon as possible, but we want to make sure it's um, in, a, in a way that everybody's comfortable with and uh, looking out for the protection of everybody as well. So keep that in mind. <clears throat> Again, I think that really is all the announcements that we do have. Allie has a special today, and her special is I'll Fly Away. <clears throat>
Thank you, Alec. I did, I was remiss. I do have a couple more announcements I want to make. Uh, we do have a thank you chart here from Roxanne. And uh, is it okay if I read it out? Okay, I, I'm going to read it out regardless. So. <laughs> All right, so she wants to express her thankful uh, wishes with gratitude. Thank you. Your thoughtful, thoughtfulness means so much to me. Thank you for your kind words, the uh, beautiful plants, and most of all, your prayers. They all, made a diffi- they all made a difficult time more bearable from Roxanne. And so do continue to pray for her and her family as they lost a dearly beloved one. Also do continue to pray for those that we've made mention uh, I know Brother Roy is still in the uh, rehab, and he's not been able to do him too well as far as walking, so continue to pray for him. Also, uh, I know some folks have asked about the Halptons, and uh, of course he's very dear to my heart and was kind of, um, some of some of the reason behind some of the latest developments that we've made as a church, and uh, he is still back in the hospital. He did get a confirm, confirmation of the coronavirus, and he's been in and out of the hospital. So do continue to pray for him and his wife. Uh, it's, they're really just those two individuals. They're in their early 70s. They don't have any children and so forth. So uh, just pray for the comfort there and pray that the doctors can find out um, some immediate uh, remedies to kind of get him back on his feet and so on and so forth there. Outside of that, I do think that's it for the prayer request. Um, I do continue to pray for Dale and Joe. Uh, they're expecting here a little a little grandbaby here soon in just the next, uh, I said six days ago, and that was about three days ago, so probably within the next week, they're going to be having an, another grandbaby, and I uh, do continue to pray for them and uh, their family as they're expecting that little one here very, very soon. All right, so if you have your Bible with you, we're going to be in First John chapter 2, 1 John chapter 2, 1 John chapter 2, and in 1 John chapter 2, really the thought this morning is the question, how much do you really know about somebody? How much do you really know about somebody or someone? I don't know about you, but have you ever experienced a moment where you thought you knew just about everything about somebody? or someone, and then they just go off the rail and surprise you about their actions. I mean, we, we oftentimes think of this of maybe some immediate family members or some close friend, and you say, you know what, he or she, they would never do anything uh, bad or evil or ill will, and then they just do something off the wall, and you think, my goodness, I don't know them at all. Or have you ever really had friends that when you go back to try to, that friendships that last for years, and uh, when you guys try to catch up, you realize you hardly know them at all. I know one of my dearest friends has been a good friend of mine for about 25 years or so of my life. We were childhood friends. And uh, I told Allie as we were heading back from Ohio a few months ago in the time of our transition, I said, you know what, I want to reconnect with this friend. His name was Austin, and I said, I want to reconnect with Austin. And, of course, we were childhood friends. I mean, we did everything together. You know, you name it. If there was a video game out, we were going to play it. And so we were just great, great friends. And I realized after connecting with them, I thought, you know what, just kind of a subconscious thought that he would be where I was at, having a family and house and so forth, and realized some things, and he thought, you know what, even though we're close childhood friends, we're completely opposite, and we're at life. And I thought, my goodness, how much do you really know about someone? And so we know people change, and life goes on, and we gain friends, and we lose friends, but when we come to our relationship with God, we encounter something totally different. I know we live in this lifestyle where friends come and go, and we kind of have these temporal uh, uh, attitudes towards our friendships. You know, sometimes we have close friends, and other times we don't. I mean, raise your hands. How many of you are still friends with those from your high school days? If you have one good friend from high school, you're ruining the illustration. All right, how many many of you are, how many of you have friends from your early childhood, say 10 or younger? You still have some friends. Okay, not too many of you there. And uh, so you're seeing that sometimes friends come and go. And I don't know about you, but what do you raise your hand? So you have a friend that you had since 10 years or younger. Do you guys still play with Hot Wheels and everything like that? They're just a lot bigger. Oh, they're a lot bigger. (laughs) I understand that. (laughs) And so we understand that, you know, life changes. Sometimes we don't do the things we always do. And I think when we have our attitude towards God, sometimes we think a little bit that way. 
that our relationship kind of comes and goes because every other relationship we have either grows or wanes and or either just, just completely cut off. And so I want to ask you this question today. How much do you really know about God today? That's the question from our, really our title of our message, how much do we really know about somebody? But that somebody that we're going to talk about today is God. How much do you really know about God? You know, sure, we can say we know him. We know about him. How much do we really know about him, though, when you stop and think about it? That's what we're going to ask today and what the Bible helps explain in 1 John chapter 2, where we're going to see an in-depth look about our love for God and how God clearly sees our love for him. So before we begin reading the word today, I want to ask the Lord to bless our time specifically in uh, these next few moments. So be, come with me in prayer and let's pray that the Lord will bless us. Dearly, Father, Lord, I once more thank you for today. Thank you, Lord, for allowing us to come together under one roof as a local church body here. Lord, I do pray, Father, as we now enter the time before we begin reading your word, that you again allow the Holy Spirit to be upon our hearts. And Father, Lord, if there's somebody here that needs to be encouraged, somebody, Lord, that needs to be comforted, and some that just need to be challenged or convicted about something, Father, help us in that. We all have unique lifestyles. We all come from a little bit of different backgrounds. And Lord, we just need you, that constant presence in our life, to give us what we need today. Father, Lord, I pray that the message today be a blessing to those that are hearing it, both here in church and those in the live stream. And be with me, Lord, as the deliverer of this message. And pray, Lord, that I wane as you grow in these next few moments. In Jesus Christ's name, I do pray. Amen. And so we first off see, really, in the first couple of verses, the basis of our fellowship. You have that Bible with you in 1 John chapter 2. I want you to read the first couple of verses with me. My little children, these things write I unto you that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And so we first off see right off the bat the little words here, and I love them, my little children. I don't know about you, but have you ever described another Christian as my little child? We just don't talk that way. But John, through the, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is talking to us, really God talking to us, and he's calling us my little children. Not my servants, not my uh, 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 p- people that are below me or, or heirs or anything like that. It's a very intimate word. It's a very word that's described love, my little children, my little child, if you want to make it singular, talking about you. And you understand that God is God, but John in this verse describes him as how he desires to relate to us as Christians today and this morning, he wants to describe to us as father, as a father. If you notice there in verse 1 and verse 2, the word God is not mentioned, but there is reference to him in one word with a capital F, and that is father. God wants to be a father to you. I don't know about you, but that's a pretty awesome thought today, thinking about that. I spent some time thinking about that this last week. And sometimes, you know, especially in the pastor world, we did, we did a little thought about how do we understand God? How do we meditate on God? How do we understand the Scriptures? Where is my relationship with them? And sometimes we just need to stop and think, you know what? God wants to relate to you as somebody who is a father to a child. That's how he wants to be related to you. That's how he wants to express himself to you. That's how the basis of your relationship is a heavenly father. And I know we say that all the time, but we just really probably need to stop for a few moments and think about that. The one who's created the universe, the one who's created billions of souls who have lived throughout the world, the one who's created trillions of planets, wants to come down to us, these little specks that he calls humans, and he says, I want to be a father to you. I want to be a father to you. And we understand for some of those who, who have healthy relationships with their fathers and others who didn't have good relationships with their fathers but kind of know about that like, we understand what a father relationship is. Somebody who wants to get behind your back and comfort you. Somebody who will always be there for you. Somebody who is your protector, is your comforter, is your friend, is your counsel. That's what God wants to be. He wants to be a father. And the word children is used here for a family connotation. My little children. And then a few short words here, that word father. It's a family letter to the Christian believers. 
Well, throughout the Bible, we read some of the Old Testament and the New Testament, and we understand the Gospels are kind of for the unsaved, and Paul gets through heavy things talking about the church. But here when we get to 1 John, it's not just another letter to the church. It's not just another letter to the Christians abroad. It's not just a letter to Christianity in all general as talking about the church and about believers. This is a love letter to a family member. That's what God wants. This is how God's writing to us in 1 John. It's a love letter to a family member. It's a text message to a family member in the 21st century. How about that? And we need to take, it's, it takes a deeper look into the church herself, and we go deeper than just the body, the assembly, the building, and we get to consider the intimate part of what we as believers are, and that is a family with a close fellowship with others in God. And I don't know about you, but that really impacted me as we were studying that this morning and kind of was looking about that in the last week because I thought, my goodness, if ever there was a time that the church is an expression of a family, it's been in these last few months where we haven't been able to come together as a local body, where we haven't been able to come together in these four walls, where we haven't been able to worship together, where psalms really haven't been sung, where the preaching really hasn't been so preaching as we know it. But really what has been expressed is those phone calls and text messages and conversations and times of small little pockets of fellowship here and there. The family time. The time that we understand it. The time that we love. And really, he who has lived for eternity, talking about God again, decided in his great grace to make what we see around us and ourselves a, a, a relationship with us. And it is God's desire that we sin not. And there in verse 2 where he says, and he is the propitiation for our sins, not for ours only, uh, but for the sins of the whole world. And I'm sorry, I I meant verse 1. My little children, these things write unto you. Why? Because those next four words, that you sin not. You know, this counteracts the idea that God loves us for who we are and just wants us to be who we are and live life every day. And life is just great and hunky-dory and 70 and sunshine and everything's just so wonderful. That's kind of what, Christian, what, what the mainstream uh, Christian view wants to put on, on the face of Christianity today. That God is just a loving person and doesn't really care who you are or what you do or how you live your life. And just come to him and say a couple of kumbaya songs and then you can leave that day and you're just going to have a great relationship with them. No. In this single verse, God establishes his relationship with you. He says, my little children, I love you as a father to a child. I love you as a parent would to a, to a children. I'm going to protect you. I'm going to comfort you. I'm going to do everything I can for you. Why? Because I don't want you to sin. That's the very next statement, the very next thought. An establishment of a relationship and the purpose of that relationship is I don't want you to sin. You know, if there was no need for us to live differently, then why would Jesus die for us? If it was the basis of our salvation to just go before the Lord and say, Lord, I'm sorry for who I am, but you've made me the way I am. and I just want to have a good relationship with you. And that was the rest of our life. Then why would there ever be need the death of Jesus Christ? Why not just come down and give us some good words to think on and then go back home and leave the offer on the table? Christ didn't do that. But God is in that way. He, He does love us for who we are. And like any father, he wants what's best for us. And what his best for us is to sin not. He sees our full potential. He sees the best that we can be, even if we don't see it or know it ourselves. I think of that as a, as, as a parent looking down to a children or a grandchild. Some of you already kind of have that mindset. You look down at your children, and you can see their potential. You can see their strengths, even if they don't see it in themselves. I remember my mom and dad uh, made me play soccer when I was about 9 or 10, and I hated soccer. I loathe soccer. I said, Dad, I don't want to play soccer. He said, you're going to play. He said, you got strong legs. you got good figure. You can do it. He says, I want you to go down to be a goalkeeper. He said, let's just start off small. I said, okay, I'll, be, I'll, I'll, I'll do that. And I quickly realized as a goalkeeper that I can just sit on the ground and pluck the grass while all the rest of the kids are playing real soccer. I thought, this is great. If this is what I have to do, I'll play soccer for the rest of my life. But it didn't work out that way. Even though my father saw a potential in me and I didn't see it for myself, he still desired it in me. And that's what God's like for us some days, I think. We don't see our potential. We don't see the best of us. But God does. He made you. He counted the hairs on your head. He knows your strengths. He knows your weaknesses. He sees your flaws. And he says that you are his little children and he wants you to sin not. 
he loves us for who we are, but he wants us to be better. He wants to see the best in us. But when we do sin, because we're going to sin, we still have the advocate. And I love that in the concluding of that verse. If any man sin, so he says, I don't want you to sin, but I know you're going to sin. And when you do sin, I've already got that covered. We have an advocate, uh, Jesus Christ the righteous, an advocate with the Father. God God not only desires for us to not sin, but he knows we're going to sin, and his Son stays as our advocate. And I don't know about you, but if you want to underline those words, if any man sin, because there's some strengthness there. Notice those words, if any man sin, if anybody sins, is really what they're saying there. It doesn't say when we repent. It doesn't say when we confess. It doesn't say when we feel bad about what we're doing. But when we're right in the middle of the heat of it, when we're right in the middle of doing the sin, we have an advocate, Jesus the righteous, Jesus Christ the righteous. We have an advocate, we have a mediator, we have a comforter with the Father. And this we do need, for we have a great accuser who's up there in day and night. If you, have, if you want to write down this right on the side of your verse there, Revelations 12.10 in Revelation 12, 10, the Bible says, I heard a loud voice. John is still talking here, the author of Revelation. I heard a loud voice saying, In heaven now is time salvation and strength, the kingdom of our God, the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. This doesn't always end the forethought of my mind, but it is nonetheless true that we have an accuser. Just as much as we have an advocate, we have an accuser, and the accuser is up there in heaven accusing us daily. Even while we're asleep, the Bible says, both day and night, he's up there accusing us. He's up there being the accuser of the brethren. He's bringing out the worst of us. And I thought about that for a moment, and I thought, you know what? The devil is pretty good about bringing out the worst of us. He's known us uh, as humankind for 6,000-some years. He knows our weaknesses. He tells God probably every moment that we, when we fall into weakness. And it, is it really hard thinking about this? I think to myself sometimes, especially in the, in the working environment employees, when I hand around some co-workers, and if you did around enough co-workers, you're going to find somebody who just likes to give you gossip and just spreads every little bad thing about everybody. I mean, there's usually always one bad apple in the basket. And I know sometimes when I go into the workforce and have been in the workforce, there's always somebody that just wants to tell me every bad thing about somebody. Oh, you don't like that person because they did A, B, C, and D. Oh, the real supervisor that you want to start liking is this person here. And I thought, you know, it's kind of hard to like somebody when somebody's sitting right next to you, giving all the bad things about them. And I thought, you know, that kind of what is like what God's doing up there at the moment. He's got the Satan on one hand just accusing us day and night and daily. And it, as for me, and as for probably most anybody, it would be hard to like anybody. But praise the Lord, God is God because God is told of all our sins. Yet in all this, he loves us for we are justified by the advocate. We are justified by that advocate. And that's why it isn't about our works that can get us into heaven. If, we, if it was based off our works, we, we would lose. I don't, I don't know about you, but I don't think I would want to go up against an opponent who's been there for 6,000 years, who knows every wrong thing I've done, and try to justify to God how I'm a good person by my works. I don't think I would want to do that. And praise the Lord, we don't have to. The Bible tells us that we are saved not by our works there in Ephesians, not by our works, but by faith alone. And who's that faith towards? Our advocate, the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And that's the salvation is opened up to all of us. That's how we can access the family of God. That's how the adoption into the family can begin. It's by simply saying, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I need your relationship. Come and save me and be my personal Lord, Savior. Ask him for God to come into your life and save you. And that's the basis of our, of our relationship. That's the basis of our fellowship. And really what happens afterwards is the proof of our fellowship in verse 3 and verse 4 as we read. Hereby do we know that we know him. How much do you really know somebody? This is the answer. Hereby do we know that we know him. If we keep his commandments, he that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. So once we have the basis of our relationship with God, once we have the basis of our fellowship with them, is that we're not just saved people, we're not just uh, uh, sinners saved by grace, even though that's true, we're not just that, we are his children and he is our father. So now the purpose of that relationship, the purpose of that fellowship, the proof of our fellowship 
is right here is that if we know him, we keep his commandments. The keeping of the commandments is really not our security, but of our assurance. Now, it's probably true, perhaps, for every believer that at one time or another in your life, we have doubt. We have doubt. And I'm not talking about doubt and doubt. I'm talking about that doubt, that, that question that comes into your life, maybe just for a, a thought throughout your whole life, or maybe something that kind of keeps pestering you. But that doubt that says, you know what? Am I really saved? Is this just it? Is it as simple as this? Is it as easy as this? Is that I just ask the Lord to come into my life and I'm saved no matter what I do or how often I do something that I'm permanently forever saved? That doubt. But I say every believer had at one time some uncertainty that they were truly saved. And that's why the Bible tells us here that it's not in a, a security. It's not saying that we have to keep his commandments to know him, but that if we know him, you're going to do the things he asked of us. And that's an assurance to us that these are not dealings of a legal nature, but one of the new commandments. Not just simple statements found in the New Testament that are of Christ, that are equally important to every believer. One preacher said this, he said the Ten Commandments were only given to the nations, talking about old-time commandments, but the New Commandments are given to us. And what are these New Commandments? It's not necessarily written in stone, but in Galatians 6, 2, you see that the Bible talks about the laws of Christ. In 1 Thessalonians 4, 2, it talks about the laws of Christ, talking about these New Testament principles, these New Testament commandments that were, that were instructed to do. And if you want to write down there in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, you can see many of them. The commandments to rejoice forevermore, the commandment to pray for one another, the commandment to be beloved and be kind to one another. These things are we instructed to do, and when we do them, we have that assurance that we know them. And you cannot have that assurance unless you engage and interact in the relationship for which God has established between you and Him. And you know, some may well say that that's not really important that doing these things are not really important, that my relationship is okay, that I think I'm okay where I'm at, that, you know what, I do a little bit of praying, I do a little bit of my reading, I think I'm okay where I'm at. I have the assurance of the Lord where I'm at. And sometimes, you know, we can get that way. But let me ask you, if we put that to the test and you were in the hospital or some loved one is in the hospital, how assured of your relationship would you be? I don't know about you, but when pandemics usually come in my life or tragedies come into my life, I get a little bit more praying to God. And when I do, I start asking God to forgive me of some sins and, and to really just hunt her down and to deepen that relationship with them. Why? Because I want him to work in my life. But if somebody here doesn't have a solid assurance of their relationship with God and tragedy does strike, how assured would you be? The Bible says if you want to be assured of your relationship, we need to be keeping his commandments. And the one who doesn't is a liar, and the truth is not in him. And what comes out of that is the result of our relationship, the result of our fellowship. This is really the, the anchored verse of our text this morning, and I want to kind of stick with it. But whoso keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we are in him. The Bible is saying here the difference between the Christian who simply follows the commandments and the Christian who follows God's word. I don't know about you, but did you notice that there's two different statements there from verse 3 and verse 5. Verse 3 tells us that hereby we do, we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. That's a good verse. That's an assuring verse. But then it goes on to say something a little bit different in verse 5. It says, but whoso keepeth his word, not commandments, his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. Two completely different words, commandment and word. One who just knows his commandments knows of them. One who does his word, the love of God is perfected in him. I see two different type of Christians here. Because he's talking, again, my little children is verse 2. John is talking to Christians here. We see two different kind of Christians. And I think in this world today we're surrounded by these two different kind of Christians. The first one who just knows him, the first one who just keeps his commandment, that's, that's the Christian who just follows God's commandment, and he's really much of like the mainstream Christian that we see today. The one who focuses on what they can and can't do to still show they're a Christian. That mindset of, well, how far can I really go before, I'm, before I don't look like the lost and before I'm a Christian, before I can be accepted? How far can I get to that line and still feel comfortable? 
The one who tries to search to live so much like the lost but can barely tell the difference. The one who sounds much like the, uh, uh, what we call a legalist today and kind of judges everybody on merit. Well, that person's a good person by what they do. That person's not so good because they don't keep these many commandments. It's that type of person that's so judgmental in their spirit. The one who lives life by the law, not by grace. The one who looks more of the Christian life by the view of right versus wrong. This is the one who just keeps his commandments. This is the one who just knows about them. This is the one who just kind of knows them. And he says, if I follow his commandments, I have assurance in him. But the one who keeps his word is the love of God perfected. And I notice that the Christian who follows God's word is the one who is matured and being perfected. That's what it's talking about here. I'm not saying that the love of God will be perfect in you, but the love of God will be not only in your thoughts, not only in your mindset, not only in how you view the world, but will be in your practice, be in your daily life, be shown in your lifestyle as well. It will be in full bloom in your life. It will be perfected. This is the Christian that stands out amongst other Christians. This is the Christian who is spirit-filled and is often sought out or enjoyed by many at their fellowships. The one who doesn't just look at life not by right versus wrong, but by judging their motives on the basis of, will this please my Father? I think we sometimes get ourselves in a lot of, a lot of struggles with that. When we start asking ourselves, and what am I doing is right versus wrong? Is what am I not doing versus right versus wrong? Am, am I doing enough things to please my to please my, my my relationship? If we stop asking ourselves what's right versus wrong and start asking ourselves, will this please my father, you'll find that the love of God will become more 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 in practice with you, more perfected with you. You're not just following his commandments. You're not just sitting here trying to underline and figure out which rules you need to live by, but you're just having a simple desire, an inner desire to know the one who wrote the book, not the ones that had the words in the book. There's a completely different style there. If I want to have a relationship with somebody, I'm not just going to base my relationship off of the conversations I have with them. I'm not going to base my relationship off the text messages that I have with them. If I was to base my relationship off of the text messages of my wife, you thought we'd be two starving people. Because the only thing that usually my wife and I have to text each other is, hey, I'm hungry, what do you want to eat? But my relationship is so much more than what the words are there. Because I seek out to know her, and she seeks out to know me. And I think as Christians, we need to do that with God. We don't just need to be focused on what he's saying. We need to focus on the author. Will it please my father? You know, I've realized sometimes the Bible tells you how to live life, but can I say this with a little grace? Not everything in life does the Bible have a true, true answer for. When you have a loved one that needs to go to the nursing home, the Bible can't answer that, really. There's not, a, there's not a scripture in the world that says, hey, I, this is what I need to do. Now there's verses that says, honor the mother and the father. But there is a question in your life where it comes into a principle where your relationship with God says, you know what, will this please my father? Having that relationship with God. Going back to the, the word, not just the commandment. Again, one preacher said this about this. He says, when the love of God has been perfected in you, you just want to pass the commandments and please him. Not so much a matter of worrying about how right and wrong you're living, but you just want to start pleasing God. You just want to start pleasing Him. And I heard a story, kind of wrapping this all up. I heard a story, not too long ago, about a farmer and his boy. It was, it was, a, little, it was a little dated, a little, a little further back in time. The boy had to go to school. I don't know how much older he was, probably about 12 or 13. The boy had to go to school Monday through Friday, and his dad was a dairy farmer. And it was getting to that time where the boy had started really getting some chores and getting a little bit of allowance, a substantial allowance. And the father and the son got to talk to him, and he says, Now, you know what? I'm going to start milking the cows if you cut the firewood for your mom. It was a little bit in the wintertime, and they needed wood for the fire about a daily day basis. And he just didn't have the time to do that. 
And I, and I thought, well, surely milking cows shouldn't take that long, but I know of a dairy farmer, and boy, you have to do it at 6 o'clock in the morning and 6 o'clock in the evening. You just got to keep up with it. So, you know, he did need some help on, on the farm there. And so the boy did it. Every time he got off of school, he'd go back home, and he would chop the wood for his mom and dad. And that kept on going for about some weeks to come, and finally uh, it came to a point where the dad was just getting a little sick. He was being outside a little too much. His immune system kind of got shot, and uh, he caught a cold. And he told the son one day, he said, you know what, I just don't think I can milk the cows today. And that's all he said. Didn't ask him to do it. Just gave him a little bit of a moment of, of sighing, a little bit of a moment of despair. The boy went back to school, and when he came back home that day, he not only cut the wood, but he milked the cows. You thought, well, hey, that's a pretty interesting story, but I wanted to tell you a little bit of, a, of, a, of, a, of the thought of that. The boy not only chopped the wood, but he milked the cows because he chopped the wood because he was told to, because that was the agreement he made with his dad. He milked the cows because he, need, he, he loved his father, and his father needed that of him. So I wanted to ask you, how much of your relationship is just chopping the wood with God or milking the cow with God? How much is God having to tell you versus what, what's your lifestyle like just by wanting a desire to please him? Do you want to know, the, for those who may be unsure of, of their salvation, for those that are a little bit unsure of what that relationship looks like, the Bible says if we keep his commandment, we've got to first off follow that first commandment, we can know him. And I'm going to take a few moments here and have an invitation time. And while we do this, I'm going to have Allie play a tune. Take a few moments with bowed heads and closed eyes. The Bible says we do have an advocate. And we do have a father and that father doesn't call us just as sons. That father doesn't call us just as Christians. But he calls us his little children. I want to ask you today, do you want to know the love of the father today? Would you like to have that advocate on your side today? Maybe you're here this morning and not for sure you're saved, not for sure... You could be called that little child. Now you've never asked that advocate in your life, Jesus Christ, to come into your life. Maybe you've kind of hung on to just being a good person and doing good things. The Bible says that Jesus Christ was the propitiation for our sins. He covered yours so that you didn't have to be that way. Your relationship was not on works, but on believing the Father. So I want to ask this morning, if you're unsure you're saved, if you don't know where you're going, if you've never really asked the Lord into your heart and life this morning, or really throughout your life, nobody's going to come to you. Nobody's going to tap you on the shoulder. I just want to pray with you today. And show you where that relationship can begin. If you say, Preacher, I don't I, I hear your word and I don't know if I'm fully saved, but I'd like to know a little bit more. I'd like your help. Pray with me. I would do it. Raise your hand. All right, Christians, you say you're saved. The question this morning was, how well do you really know somebody? I'm not entirely sure of that answer. But I am sure that the Bible lays it out for us clearly that we can have confidence in our fellowship, our relationship with the Father. What about you this morning? Are you the Christian who just follows the commandments? Who does just the bare minimum to get by? Or are you ready to grow more? Are you ready to finally live the life your Father wants you to have? The best life that He could give you. God wants you to today. He waits for you to make that first move. He waits for you to ask Him. I know we're all here today that to say, you know what? 
I do want to have a better relationship with God. I do want to be closer to Him. I don't want to just know Him by His commandments. I want to know Him, the author. I want to see His working in my life. Let's take a moment to pray real quick and close out the service. Again, it was a joy to see each and every one of you. It was a tremendous joy and a blessing to my heart personally to be back in the house of God today. And uh, looking forward here in the next week or so to come to uh, be in his house a little bit more frequently than we have been. And that will be a joy to both you and I, I'm sure. So let's, let's go before God one more time and ask for his blessings uh, into this day and throughout the week to come. And Jesus Christ. Lord, Heavenly Father, I come before you. God, we say this enough and we say this often. We do love you, but you were first to love us. You were the first to call us your little children, not us to call you our Father. Lord, what a tremendous relationship we've been given. Father, I pray, Lord, that you give each and every one of us a little time this afternoon to maybe study that, to maybe meditate on that, time to think about our relationship with you. And like I said earlier, I know, Lord, we all come from different backgrounds, we all come from different walks of life, but as Christians here in just 1 John chapter 2, you've laid it out pretty plainly. We can be a Christian who just simply follows the book, follows the commandments, and just knows you. Or we can be a disciple and live and live in the Word and make the Word live in us on a day-to-day basis and seek to know you and not just your commandments. Father, I pray that that's our desire for each and every one of us. Lord, help us to have that desire. Help us to enable that desire in our life. To not only make it a desire, but to make it practiced in our life. Lord, I pray for each and every one of us here today. Pray for the prayer requests that are on our hearts. I know many have unspoken ones. I know many are burdened with some prayer requests, and I just pray with them in those unspokens. Pray, Lord, for our church to come in the weeks ahead as well. Again, continue to pray for your healing hand and your safety on our church. And, Lord, be with us and give us your wisdom for in the days and weeks ahead to move safely and with your grace to continue worshiping you as we are told to do and love to do. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll be live streaming tonight, continuing our series with Daniel. Looking forward to that. And so, uh, again, we'll be having some more information here in the next day or so uh, with an email. So just kind of be on the lookout for that. And uh, I think that's it for our announcement. So God bless. Have a great week. And see you next time.